Hello, everybody. Just going to leave a few minutes or so here for people to settle in. Hello, Graham. Hi, Susie. Hello, Marsha. Oh, people are coming in hot right now. Brian, Christine, Dave, Michael. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. So we have uh, very excited to have Greg Legas from Edgepoint Wealth Management here to present kind of uh, the, the take on where where we are, the Edgepoint approach, uh, what you should be thinking about and help answer a lot of the, the questions that, that we might have today. So we were joking with Greg that when we planned this a few months ago, we couldn't have picked a better date to, to, to have it. So uh, if that insight rings true to how Edgepoint manages things, uh, we're, we're in good hands. Uh, so yeah. hi, Barry. Hello, Christine. Hi, Dave. Hi, Hardeep, Marty, Maurice, Michael. So I'll give uh, just a, another minute here and, and Leo, we can move forward in the slides and then we'll get to the introductions. Uh, this will make our compliance team happy. But uh, again, thanks to everybody for joining. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, quite excited to, uh, to get into this today. What we will have is an interactive forum. So Greg does have a presentation that he's going to take us through. That being said, part of this is to be able to share, ask your questions. I'm sure you might have uh, many these days, but uh, Greg's going to bring some uh, shed some light and uh, kind of peel back some of the layers and explaining where we are, where things go, and what the edge point approach is to, uh, to managing and how, how that fits with uh, the broader picture of, uh, of investments and, and things these days. So uh, I believe everybody is here. It's 12.04. So we, uh, hello, Ramit, just checking to see if anybody else is here. So we have a good slew of individuals attending. So very excited to uh, be sharing this lunch hour with you. Hi, Ramit. So a few housekeeping items, chat below, Q&A below. P please do feel free to ask your questions anytime. Per and I will be monitoring that and we'll share that uh, with Greg if there's a pertinent question throughout. And then we also have a Q&A at the end. But please do feel free. This is uh, part of the appeal. Is It's an interactive webinar and we want to get uh, some dialogue and discussion. So this is our team. Very excited to have Pera, Jeff, and the whole team with you today. Leia is running the back end, so thank you for that. And Ose attending. Uh, you know us, you know our faces, but now you get to see us both in static and in motion. So thanks for that today. And thank you to, to Zoom for allowing us to keep running this webinars. And uh, without further ado, very excited to have Greg Legas from Edgepoint here today. Uh, we Edgepoint is, is a part of uh, many of our retiree and, and uh, other growing portfolios. So we wanted to have Greg to really kind of share and peel back the layers uh, as to what they do, what the approach is, and what uh, he views going on in the market these days. And we know lots uh, is uh, a lot of moving pieces are going around and uh, no better time to share and have Greg present uh, the edge point approach and, and take us through what their team sees in the market and where we are uh, from going from here. So Greg, without further ado, I will pass it over to you and uh, please do take it away, Greg. Hey, well, thank you very much. Uh, I will start by just Thanking Jeff, Eric, and Pear for giving me an opportunity to speak with some of your best friends. Mm. And let me just pull up uh, my sl slide deck here. And hopefully everybody can see this. Maybe uh, one of the panelists can give me a thumbs up if you see it on your end. Okay. Yeah, more, com more compliance slides, everybody. So Yeah, enjoy. so I, I think enjoy our that. compliance is going to be happy if I just... Uh, if you're looking for advice from me, you won't find it here. Uh, there are the other panelists that will make sense of this. Uh, I think um, knowing the, the guys, they really focus on financial planning. And uh, so we just want to give you a bit of our insights, but it's really not tailored uh, specifically to you. So uh, uh, my lawyers are now happy. Your lawyers are happy. Now we can we can move on. So you want to hit share, uh, like to start the slideshow itself, Greg? Oh, is it not uh, showing? No, it's not. It's showing the um, you know, the software. Still okay, hold on. Edit second. mode. I'm going to stop sharing here. I'm, sometimes when I go into um, full screen mode, it gives me a bit of a problem. No. So, can you see this now? Well, I don't see it as like um, a big slide. I see it more like your yeah. Okay. Your well, I'll, I'll go to full screen, but yeah, I I don't know if there's a glitch in Zoom these days, but I've had. I've, does that go to full yeah. screen? Oh, it's probably no, not. It hasn't. Another screen. That's okay. We can just run. You can run it like this, and we can disregard okay. the ribbon. It's okay. Clear enough. As we'll figure so, it out. Sorry, and I'm sorry, everybody who's attending, that we should have ironed this out. Could, do you see the slide now or not? Yes, slides yeah, are. We see it, but uh, it's sort of not in uh, presentation mode. Oh, it's not okay. So I'm going to 
I'll try one more time. I'm going to hover over stop share and see if it starts to behave. So stop, so, yeah, with stop share. Yeah, I'm going to screen share again. Well, uh, Greg, maybe you should open the presentation first in PowerPoint, if it's a PowerPoint or whatever it is, as a full presentation and then oh, go. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if I, um, yeah, sorry, everybody, we will get there. So first of all, put it to uh, full screen, correct? And then we will I'll exit out. Then you stop share and then you yeah. open it again. And then we stop share and then we go, okay. You think it's after two years as well, a few cases. You think after two years, I'd figure this out. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I, we're gonna go regardless here. So um, listen, I, I know uh, with the markets doing what they've done so far this year, there's a, there's a real um, need to get to that. But I think because a lot of you may not be familiar with who we are, I wanted to very briefly just walk through a little bit about who Edgepoint is and a little bit about our investment approach. And so hopefully that gives context to, to kind of our view on the markets and how we're positioned. Um, we're a private business. We were founded in uh, November of 2008 by four uh, gentlemen. And, and for those of you who have been investing for a while, you may recognize the name Bob Kremble, who was the original co-founder of Trimark. So Bob Kremble and three of the portfolio managers uh, decided to start Edgepoint in 2008. Um, collectively, between those four founders, there is a, um, a very successful 50-year track record of stewarding wealth for people and, and adding value versus the benchmarks. And our singular focus at Edgepoint is what you would expect it to be, and that is to uh, compound wealth at the top of our peer group over the long term. And while there's no finish line in this business, what I have in front of you, you may see it or not, but uh, the Edgepoint Global Growth and Income Portfolio, which is the core mandate that the um, uh, Jeff, Eric, and Pear uh, own within, their, within your portfolios. Since we started in November of 08 to the end of 2021, our benchmark is up 236%, and the Edgepoint Global Growth and Income Portfolio is up 369%. So again, uh, we've been able to, to add value, um, but certainly there was no finish line, but we're, uh, we're so far so good. Uh, in terms of, uh, our, we have about 81 employees at Edgepoint. We run about 31 and a half billion in assets. That number to me is, is not that important versus under alignment of interest here. Uh, there are 81 employees that collectively have 352 million of our own money in these same portfolios. So for most of us, and me included, that's the vast majority of my liquid net worth. So it really just highlights that we're kind of uh, in the same boat as you. So anyway, that, that's a quick update on who is Edgepoint. In terms of the investment approach, let me take a, a, just a, a brief minute and walk you through a bit of an exercise. So imagine for a moment, all of you on the call, that you, you had to trade in everything you own, all your material possessions, and in exchange, you were given a million dollars. And with that million dollars, you had to go out and buy a business. And the earnings from that business was going to support you and your family now and into the future. Uh, think about what kind of business you would own. Um, and, and, you know, you and your family are sitting around a table with this check for a million dollars. And you're talking about what kind of business to buy. And you hear a knock on the door. And someone says, listen, I, I heard about, you know, you've got some money to invest. And here's a chart on a stock. And it shows two lines crossing. And historically, that means that this stock price is about to go higher. Give me your million dollars to, to take care of your family and buy this company. Um, I'm pretty sure none of you would do that, but that is called technical investing and billions of dollars trade every day in the market under that premise. Uh, or what if you another knock on the door and someone says, listen, I'm going to tell you nothing about this business, only that this quarter's earnings are higher than last quarter's earnings. Give me that million dollars to, to invest in this business and take care of your family. I think it's rhetorical. Uh, would you do it? No, I, I don't think you would. Um, well, that's called momentum investing and billions of dollars trade under that premise on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so what would you do if you had to buy a business to take care of your family? I, I think most of you would do something very similar to what we do at Edgepoint. You know, the first thing we want to do is find a profitable business, right? That makes sense. Um, does it have a competitive advantage to protect those profits now and into the future? Uh, does it have a sound management team in place to, to make rational business decisions? Um, and, and I think you'd really want it to see, can it grow, right? Can it launch into new markets? Can it launch new products? Can you, can you have a growing stream of cash flow coming from this investment? 
And if many of you are thinking this sounds easy, uh, you're right. This is the easy part of what we do. So let me break it down between our approach to growth and our approach to managing risk. And really, the easy part is finding a company with all of those attributes that I just mentioned. Uh, what, and I'm sure if I gave you five minutes, all of you on the, the line could come up with a list of five to 10 businesses that fit that criteria. Where we add value is can we identify those great businesses that are going to grow and buy it without paying for the growth that we see, right? Um, the irony of the stock market is ever, everybody knows the business has a bright future that's usually already reflected in the stock price. So the magic formula is finding, you know, do we know something that most market participants don't know? We call that proprietary insight. That's the really tricky thing that we do. Uh, there's, you know, there's various ways we do it, but often it, it, it's entitled, it, it, it's accomplished by thinking a bit longer term than most people. So that's our approach to growth, right? Identify a great growth business and buy it without paying for the growth. And if we're right with our proprietary insight, all that growth comes to us and you by default, right? So that's the approach to growth. Our approach to managing risk, there's two key tenants to this. The first one is to diversify our portfolios by idea. So what you have here is a list of 13 companies that represent over half the Edgepoint global portfolio. And as if I read the first few off for you, you'll quickly find out that none of them have anything to do with each other, right? A US railroad, a cosmetics company, a plastic packaging company, a Dutch healthcare a technology company, right? None of them have anything to do with each other. And because we, we realize as humans, we're, we're fallible. We're going to make mistakes. So uh, our best ideas are typically three, four, five percent of a portfolio. That means if we do make a mistake in our proprietary insight, it impacts three, four, five percent. But we didn't make a big bet on something that is 30, 40, 50 percent of the portfolio because then you can go really wrong, right? So that's the chief way of managing risk. The second thing is to, to make sure we're not too correlated to any one potential outcome. What I mean by that is, you know, interest rates can be higher and lower than what people expect, right? Inflation can be higher or lower than what people expect. Oil prices. Um, we just make sure that, you know, for example, if interest rates go higher than people expect, we will have some companies that will benefit from that and some companies that will be hurt by that. But you know, we're not going to get caught if, if rates go higher than we expect that the whole portfolio is going to be uh, really impacted negatively. So it's, it's really, I think in a word, is we're trying to build resiliency in the portfolio because the future is inherently unknowable. I'm going to take a stab at it today. But it's, an, it's inherently unknowable and um, you want to make sure that, you know, 100 potential outcomes could happen. Will the portfolio be resilient? And, and that really is kind of the risk management uh, from our perspective. So let's now pivot uh, to kind of talking about the markets and the environment that we're working in. You know, and, and I know there's a lot of interest in what's going on now, and I'll certainly give some perspective you almost have to go back to the beginning of COVID, right? And because there's a lot of things that have happened that have impacted last year that are impacting the current market. Um, but prior to going into that, I'm going to refer to price earnings ratios in this segment. And I'm sure a bunch of highly educated, smart people that are tuning into an investment webinar are probably, uh, probably understand what a price earnings ratio is. But just in case someone out is out there that doesn't know, I just want to give the 101 on this, right? So if you're buying a business and that business generates $100,000 in profit and you're being asked to pay a million dollars for that company, that is a PE ratio of 10, right? The price of the business, a million divided by the 100,000 that you're paying for it, you're paying 10 times earnings for that business. That's a price earnings ratio. Put another way, you're getting a 10% rate of return on that investment, right? So if you pay for a million dollars for this investment, this business, and it gives you 100,000 in the bank account at the end of the year, that's a 10% rate of return. Or put another way, if the earnings of that business doesn't grow, it would take you 10 years to get your money back. Now here's the same business earning 100,000, but instead of paying a million for it, you're gonna pay 3 million for it, which means you're paying 30 times earnings, right? Or again, getting a three, per, three and a third percent rate of return on that capital. Or if the earnings didn't grow, it would take you 30 years to, to, to make your money back. Now, if that sounds expensive to you, we agree. We think it is. Uh, to give you perspective, the, the average price earnings multiple on the market over the past 100 years is somewhere in that 15 
to 17 times range. So with that in mind, let's transition to what's going on. I'm going to draw your line if you can't see the slide here, but this is the most uncertain investing environment that we collectively at Edgepoint have ever experienced in our careers. Um, it doesn't mean it's dangerous. It doesn't mean you can't make money. It's just there's an extreme amount of uncertainty. And you know, you think it, it sounds funny coming from a company that started in November of 08. And if you re rewind the clock, that was the global financial crisis. But back in 08, it was a real binary decision. Is the global financial system going to collapse or not? Uh, we made a bet on the future that it wouldn't, and that turned out to be true. But if you look at today, COVID has unleashed, you know, the biggest health crisis we've seen globally in 100 years, uh, and the various waves and variants and everything else has created a lot of uncertainty right there. You know, the, the first response was a lot of governments around the world shut down their economies. And then you saw governments uh, unleash a huge amount of support for workers and businesses to kind of survive those lockdowns. And that was absolutely needed to prevent a depression. Um, you then had central bankers, right, like the United States, flood the system with liquidity, taking interest rates down to zero, um, you know, quantitative easing, you know, making up a whole bunch of money to go into the bond market to buy mortgage bonds, corporate bonds, government bonds to kind of drive interest rates down and just have a whole bunch of liquidity out there to encourage the risk taking and encourage the economy to take off. And, and that's happened. I mean, the, the good thing is, uh, is, is we have some inflation now. It's coming in a little hotter uh, than, than maybe is comfortable for a lot of people. You know, I think the year over year CPI in the States came in at 7%. Uh, the year over CPI in Canada, I think was 4.8, 4.9, similar in the UK. Um, you know, that's against the backdrop where they're trying to keep it at that 2% level. That's, that's running a little hot. And, and to jump ahead a little bit, I mean, that's why you're seeing the markets really start to wobble is they're saying, hey, uh, the Fed is talking about taking stimulus out, reducing liquidity. Um, you know, the Fed, for example, last year created $1.2 trillion by pressing a button, make up money <laughs> as they can do to buy bonds, to keep rates low. Well, they're talking about not doing that this year. That's inherently going to lead to higher rates, right? If, if, uh, if from that standpoint, um, and that has a whole knockdown effect on, on a lot of stuff. But what's interesting from our perspective is with the backdrop of uncertainty that we see in the markets with all of these moving parts, the market, barring the last couple of days, is positioned for more of the same, um, meaning they're predicting low interest rates, predicting low inflation. And, and let me give you a proxy for that, an example. On this chart, if you see it, great. If not, I'll describe it. We have the top 10 stocks on the NASDAQ index. So things like Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Tesla, NVIDIA, uh, Meta, Adobe, Netflix, Costco, um, great businesses. You know, these are just world-class businesses. But we have some valuations where we're looking at the price earnings ratio. And if you go back pre-COVID at January 30th, 2020, so before the world knew COVID was, was happening, they were trading at 32 times forward earnings. In fact, two-year forward earnings. So the market was anticipating, what are the earnings two years from now? And they're trading at 32 times. So as a shop that's looking to try to get growth for free, we were finding it challenging at those kind of multiples and, and felt it was quite pricey. So we were looking for growth in other areas of the market. Then COVID hits. Massive amount of uncertainty. Economies closing down. Interest rates going to zero. And with that as a backdrop, you know, people felt comfortable that, you know, Apple, people were going to buy an iPad and an iPhone. That wasn't changing, right? Uh, Microsoft, we still use that. Um, Amazon, I mean, my wife is on first name terms with the Amazon driver, I think. Uh, I think they think she runs a small business. Anyway, we knew those, those high quality businesses had a lot of certainty around them during a very uncertain time. And look at what happened to their multiple. On November 26 of 2021, we're talking what, like, like not even a couple of months ago, people were willing to take, pay 50 times two-year forward earnings for those businesses. You know, to us, we, they are great businesses, don't get us wrong, but it's the safety of the herd, right? When, when there's uncertain times and these offer certainty, 
people are very comfortable and they were willing to pay a much higher multiple. And take a look at how much these businesses dominate the big indexes. So for the NASDAQ, these top 10 names represent 57%, over half the benchmark are these names. For the S&P 500, it's supposed to be much more diversified. It's still close to a third of the index. And the MSCI World Index, where there's over a thousand names on that index, it's still nine, almost 20%. Uh, of that index. And, and hey, listen, they did well. They did 46% last year on average. You know, uh, some earnings growth and a lot of multiple expansion in terms of people willing to pay a higher price earnings multiple. And, and on that note, uh, just to kind of, I want to drive home a point, and that is there is a big difference between a great business and a successful investment, right? Microsoft, for example, and we've owned Microsoft in the past, um, so it's not that we're anti these tech names, but I'm going to bring you back to the dot-com bubble. Now, things were very different then. It's not the same. So I don't want to make a direct comparison with this example. But if you look March 10 of 2000 at the peak of the tech bubble, Microsoft was at 63 times earnings. When the tech bubble popped, that was down 56%. But look at this, the recovery time, 13 years to break even on Microsoft. I'm not saying that that's going to happen, right? Microsoft's a great business. The multiple today at 31 is much cheaper than it was back at the height of the tech bubble. Um, all I'm trying to highlight is there is a difference between a great business and a successful investment. And that often comes down to entry price. You know, one of my favorite ones, look at Cisco, the plumbing to the internet, great growth ahead of it. And people were right. The business is way bigger than it was back in March of 2000. But they got a little enthusiastic. We're paying close to 200 times earnings for this business. And look at recovery time to be determined. <laughs> you know, that's we define risk at Edgepoint as permanent loss of capital, meaning if you're in your mid 50s and you don't get your money back after accounting for inflation by the time you pass on that, that's permanent loss of capital. And that happened to someone who was 55 that bought Cisco back in March 10 of 2000. Um, not that the business wasn't good, but the entry price was too high. So our strategy since COVID hit, uh, I think is really easy to articulate. And there's been pros and cons to this in the short term, but we think the long term, it's, it's, it's very advantageous. But when it was clear to us there was a global uh, pandemic, we kind of put in a, all of the stocks in the world into three various buckets. And we call, call this kind of the survivorship spectrum. If you look at the far right on this chart, we note businesses at the epicenter, cruise lines, airlines, hotels. We immediately said these are uninvestable with the uncertainty of COVID because um, we know we'll get through it, but we just don't know the timing. And these companies may be burning through a lot of cash and maybe they go to zero. So let's just take that group of companies and not even look at it. On the far left, we have what we call the obvious survivors, right? You're locked at home. Everybody knows Netflix is going to survive. You know, people are going to order from Amazon, uh, grocery stores, all of those things were obvious. They provided a lot of certainty and comfort. And so people flocked there and uh, for good reason. But from our standpoint, if we're trying to generate compelling long-term results that are at the top of our peer group and above the benchmarks, well, we can't do what everybody else is doing. So we said, can we find a bucket called the non-obvious survivors, companies that will survive, that will continue to grow, but because they're not on the tips of people's tongue or there's some short-term uncertainty, this is where the entry price is gonna be great. And we can really generate those great long-term rates of return. And you know, if you look at our strategy last year, uh, our global fund did around the index, let's call it 20%. Um, now it might look like we're a closet indexer because of that, but I can tell you it was pure coincidence if you break it down the first half of the year, think about that. You have Pfizer, uh, Moderna, shots were going in arms. This was pre-Delta. People were confident. The world was getting back to normal. They were willing to look outside those obvious growers. And our portfolio started to outperform where uh, the first half of the year it did 14% where the index did 10. But the back half of the year, look at this, from June 30th to the back end, uh, all of a sudden Delta hits, people are worried again. And the MSCI is up 10 and we're up five, right? So we start to underperform the benchmark. So we had an index-like return with, by the way, without owning all of those uh, uh, high value tech stocks, we still managed to keep up, which was, was, was pretty insightful. So 
How does that translate? If we looked at our top 10 stocks today, so it, it, on the slide in front of you, what I have is Edgepoint Global, our top 10 positions versus the top 10 on the MSCI World Index. And by the way, a couple of things I'll note, look at the top 10 on the MSCI World Index. They're all the US names. <laughs> and they're Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Tesla, Facebook, well, Meta, right? But now Facebook, NVIDIA, um, et cetera. Isn't that amazing how much these large cap US tech names dominate even a diversified global benchmark? Um, and if you look at their valuations, they're trading on average at 41 times this year's expected earnings and 33 times next year's expected earnings. Now, if interest rates do go higher, that has a bigger impact on the growth stocks in general. And the higher the PE, typically the bigger the impact. And, and that's what we've started to see in the market. You know, uh, Pear and I were talking prior to this, um, you know, the, not like a DocuSign or a Peloton or those companies are bad, but they really weren't earning anything. Uh, you know, they're off 50, 60, 70%. Um, and they're still trading at like nine times sales, right? They don't have earnings, so you can't do a PE ratio. And, and, you know, versus the really higher quality stuff like Apple, Microsoft, that is earning stuff, that stuff's down a lot less. It might be off 10%, right, from their highs um, at much more reasonable valuations. But if we contrast that to our top 10, so again, uh, non-obvious survivors, these are companies we have ideas, and I'll give you two case studies that are growing just as fast as an Apple and Microsoft and Alphabet, but they're trading at much cheaper uh, price earnings multiple. So you can see this top 10, instead of 41 on the index, we're 17 times uh, this year's expected earnings, which again is closer to the long-term average. So if you do get rates going higher and we do get a multiple contraction in general, certainly our portfolio won't be impacted as much. Uh, you can see based on 2023 earnings estimates, we're at 15 times earnings. Now, we're not your deep value, old school shop. These are growth businesses. And, and I'll get into a couple of examples. Uh, I should pause, guys. Are, are there any questions that have come in at this point? I've been, I've been like a uh, wind-up doll. Oh, you've been doing great. Um, you know, I think uh, so far we're waiting for the questions to come in, but I'm sure there'll be plenty. I know there was a few pre-submitted, and I'll get to those. Great. The last part I have and, until we open it up for, for, for the Q&A is really just kind of giving you two examples of our top 10 holdings and the valuations and the growth potential that we see to kind of give a bit of insight as to the value of our portfolio in these uncertain times. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is our number one hold, holding, and it's very global. Um, most of you would have never heard of this company. They are uh, the largest um, plastics packaging company. And I know as soon as I say plastic, there's a few ESG questions that will come up. Uh, by the way, this is rated low on an ESG risk. I'll get to that. This is not the bad plastic like straws, you know, and, and uh, a plastic cutlery, uh, one-time use. This is the plastic in a, uh, in a surgical mask, in a surgical gown. It's literally PPE. They're in thousands of products. They're the plastic lining in a diaper. Right? So they are literally embedded in the fa you know, in Procter and Gamble's factory. They've got a very little one piece of plastic that does the lining of the diaper. If you go to the pharmacy uh, to get your cholesterol pills, they're the plastic in the bottle. If you're buying um, a chicken and it, it, it's, it's um, uh, air, airtight wrapped, they're the plastic that kind of uh, makes sure the chicken doesn't go bad or, or last twice as long. Um, they are literally in thousands of different products. They went public in 2014. They've been compounding their earnings since they went public at 20% a year. This is a great growth business. They're in a very stable business. Uh, they grow typically through acquisition. Uh, they made a huge one in 2019, making them the biggest in the world. Uh, it's a very fragmented industry. They now have 35% global market share, which makes sure that, you know, that the input cost of plastic is resin. So now they get the lowest cost on their input cost for, for this, giving them a huge competitive advantage. But listen to this, 11% free cash flow yield. So there's a few smart guys in the call and maybe some accountants or business owners that know free cash flow, but let, I hate when people use jargon. Uh, and not explain it. So free cash flow yields, really easy concept. If you own the business, how much money is in the bank at the end of the year that you can dividend to yourself, right? It's cash in the bank. 
after you've paid your salaries, after you've paid your taxes, after you've invested in your plant and equipment to ensure it's modernized, to ensure the long-term nature of the business, after all that's been accounted for, how much cash is in the bank that you could take out as an owner of the business? Free cash flow. Barry Global today has an 11% free cash flow yield. So what that means to us, even if they don't grow and they take that money at the end of the year and buy back their own stock, they're buying into an investment that is compounding at 11%. Now, to give you context, Microsoft is an amazing company, but its free cash flow yield is 3%. So if Microsoft paid, off, paid out all of its cash in the bank at the end of the year, you'd be getting 3%. Now, the argument there is, but they're growing. Well, so is Barry, right? In fact, you know, Microsoft is a two and a quarter trillion dollar market cap. Um, it gets incrementally harder to maintain a really high growth rate and move the needle at, at that versus Barry, that's a $9 billion market cap, right? Um, so we, let's be conservative, 10% earnings growth, 11% free cash flow yield. You know, if we're half right on this, I, I think we, we've got something that we feel we can compound at, you know, easily double digits, um, probably mid to high teens or higher, um, you know, and not depend on a multiple expansion. The multiple can stay where it is. So there's, a, there's an example of our number one holding, right? If I go back to that last slide, very global, it's a 6.37 weight. Look at the PE, it's trading at 10 times this year's expected earnings and nine times next year's expected earnings. Again, you get a contraction of PEs in the market because of higher rates and higher inflation. We may be impacted, but nowhere near some of the, the higher multiple growth stocks. Um, let me transition to the second uh, case study, which is Anthem. This is a healthcare insurance company in the United States. It operates under Blue Cross Blue Shield brands. Um, what you have in front of you is uh, a chart and it go, shows their earnings per share going back to 2009. So if you can't see it, I'll read this off. Back in 2009, Anthem's earnings per share was $6.09. And if you follow these gray bars, they go up every year, regardless of the macroeconomic backdrop or the economy. And they are now sitting at $22.50. So huge growth in their earnings. In fact, Anthem when we originally started Edgepoint Global, we held this stock for 10 years. It was the longest uh, holding security in the original portfolio when we started the business. And we sold in January of 18 because uh, there was relatively better opportunities at the time. Um, but we found another opportunity to buy back in in March of last year, and it, it's continued to do well since then. Um, now, free cash flow, well, let me give you a free cash flow yield 7.7%. We have ideas behind why we think they can compound their earnings growth at 12 to 15% over the next five years. Again, in line with a lot of those large cap tech stocks in terms of growth rates and a 7.7% free cash flow yield. Um, extremely attractive in this environment. Uh, here's the quick thesis on, on, um, on Anthem. Again, healthcare insurance. So in the United States, which is where they provide it, uh, healthcare insurance, they do healthcare insurance by state. And in the states that they compete in, they're the largest market share. So meaning they can go to hospitals and doctors and negotiate the best rates. They can go to pharmaceutical companies and negotiate the best rates, which means their costs are lower than any, everybody else. So this is a bit of a solution to the high rising costs of healthcare in the United States when you get some of these players uh, that are helping driving down costs. Um, so they're in, they're in a great position. And by the way, I know uh, one of the pre-submitted questions is what do we do to protect the downside? So let me just address that with this chart. Uh, I highlighted our definition of risk is probably different than most of you on the call. Uh, our definition of risk was buying Cisco at the height of the tech bubble and not breaking even 20 years later, right? Permanent loss of capital is our definition of risk. You buy a security, it goes down and stays down for an extended period of time. Contrary to that, volatility in our view is opportunity. We spend 90% of our time as business analysts. What is this company worth? And when you see a stock sell off because of a global financial crisis that's got nothing to do with the company or Greece is threatening to not pay back their debts and it goes down by 35% and it doesn't impact the business, is that risk? No, from our standpoint, it's opportunity to add to our positions at, at those moments in time and manage the weights within the portfolio. 
you know, there there was some credibility with Obama getting elected and, and it sold off dramatically because, you know, he was launching the Affordable Care Act and they thought that would reduce the profit margins on health insurance companies. But we knew as a lowest cost provider, they were in a great uh, uh, a position to withstand that and emerge actually with greater market share. So um, our def how do we protect the downside? It's diversifying. It's getting our ideas right. It's buying at good prices. Um, and then if we feel we've made a mistake, getting quick to sell it, right? But volatility is opportunity. Risk is permanent loss of capital. That's our biggest way to protect the downside. Uh, not too correlated to any one outcome, not too uh, dependent on one industry or business. Just really bring a, a concentrated portfolio. You'll see that our top 10 is about 42% of the portfolio, but diversified by idea. So anyway, I'm going to finish my comments there, hand it over to the gang um, and just see if, I know there was another couple of questions. Um, uh, so maybe we can pivot to that, Eric. Absolutely. So thanks, Greg. That's uh, I'm very, very insightful. And I like how you shared a few of the, the stories from the portfolios. I mean, a lot of the clients, we, we don't get to see what goes on under the hood. So really bringing that to life, uh, I think is very helpful for clients to, to understand the what the theories are and what the rationale is for for certain types of of investments and, and management teams we did have a question that came through uh, from uh, from hardy thank you for sharing that maybe greg if you still have the slides i wanted to go back to one of these slides yeah. that you had and i think it was on the how you bucketed companies or how edge point thought about uh, three yeah. different yeah. types of buckets uh, non-obvious spectrum this one yeah. Perfect. So Hardeep is asking specifically on the airlines industry and what the thoughts are there, but I want to bring you back to this one to look at kind of businesses at the epicenter. And if you can maybe share your thoughts on how Edgepoint thinks about those businesses and then maybe some thoughts on uh, the, the airline industry specifically, but maybe if you could share some light on that side of that spectrum. Yeah, happy to, right? So again, let me give perspective, right? When the market was down 33% when COVID first hit and, and uh, they kind of closed economies around the world, because everything was down so much, we go, do we need to make a bet on Air Canada or can we go to Barry Global? Um, because they were both down a similar amount, Barry Global had a 24% free cash flow yield uh, at the bottom of that market where we added 81% to our position. So I want to give context, you know, and, and because there was unknowns about how long COVID was going to last, uh, we go, well, why would we need this downside, Right. But, but full disclosure, heading into the pandemic, we owned Air Canada. We had a wonderful thesis on Air Canada. Um, you know, they, they, they had a new management team in, they had a three-step plan. They, they had done, a, they write, you know, they did a lot to kind of manage the cost of their business, um, generate great returns, use the cash to buy more planes, get the capacity back. Um, really a wonderful thesis on the business and COVID just came in and crushed that thesis. And, and they've had to take on massive amounts of debt um, to survive this. And so, you know, we look at it and yeah, they, they were positioned better than any other airline in North America act financially to get through this crisis. And of course, uh, with the government giving them some guaranteed loans to ensure they survived, uh, we knew they would get through. Um, but, but coming out the other side, we knew they would have another 5 billion in debt that they didn't have going in. We knew they'd be subject to government whims because of that, uh, that backstop where they might say, hey, you have to fly to none of it. We don't care if you don't make any money, we backed you. And, you know, so a bunch more debt, government involvement, alternatives like Barry Global, we don't need the hassle and we sold and we moved on. So, so you know, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Maybe you can just double check, but um, that's, you know, let me just kind of cut my comments there to see if that kind of gets to the heart of the question. Greg, and not to mention the fact that the air aviation industry is very dependent on energy prices. And yeah, energy there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot it's, of a, it's a volatile pick in best, at the best of times. Yeah. And, and not to, you know, someone can ask us about energy, but we think oil is going a lot higher here. Um, we, we need to transition uh, to a, a cleaner carbon footprint and a clean grid, but we're not ready yet. And I think we're coming to renewables too quick, too soon. And uh, not investing in, in production growth, and that's going to come back to bite. And um, so, you know, from an energy perspective, I can go into that more if there's more questions, but uh, don't be surprised if you see oil at $100 this year. So if I can chime in for just a quick second, because I know 
you know, based on what we see in the news these days, based on the fact that we've had three really strong years, uh, you know, all the stimulus money that uh, helped promote that individual investors have been buying. It looks like individual investors are getting a little antsy and they're the ones that are selling and, and creating a, an adjustment here. Um, you know, what's the macro overlay? What would make you happy? And what I mean, what would you expect to be within well within reason as far as uh, a short uh, you know, correction for whatever the macro reasons would be and uh, the three to five year uh, window uh, of returns uh, or not returns, but the what would you say would be a successful three to five years going forward? Yeah, certainly they're not going to be as good uh, as, as we've seen, right? And um, uh, I think this is the real strength. Part of the strength you guys as a team bring to the table is, is many decades of experience in, in having a plan based on people's needs. And, uh, you know, so just to back up a second, how easy would it have been in March of 2000 to cash out of the market? Um, and, and of you know, walk away from the plan because it was a highly emotional, highly uncertain time. And it really shows you the, the, the value you guys can bring to your table if you have a plan based on their needs. Uh, having said that, the next three, you know, the markets traditionally, quote unquote, the markets are, are, are dominated by a lot of high multiple names right now. Um, and, and that would suggest returns going forward uh, are, are going to be less than what we've seen them be. Um, it, a lot of it's going to depend on, you know, do we get another variant? I mean, our best guess, we're not epidemiologists, but our get, best guess is we're getting closer to the end of this thing. And this Om Omicron wave has really burned through. Um, and uh, it's a mild aversion, thank goodness. And, and um, you know, I think we're getting more back to normal, but we could get thrown a curveball on that. And, uh, and uh, so that's one thing, you know, interest rates, I think central bankers, you know, Jeff, there, there's a lot of people and maybe you're too young to even remember, but um, you know, people talk to people who are 70 and or 65 that took mortgages out in late 70s, early 80s. Um, you know, at double digit rates and infl you know, inflation was running a lot higher. A lot of people have never seen that, right? Um, that before. So central banks, we need that. We need some credibility. They need to step up and raise rates. Um, so you know, how far, how fast? They're also going to, you know, stop uh, printing money and buying bonds. And what does that do? So I think there's a lot of moving pieces here. It goes back to that uncertainty. Um, where do you see rates? Uh, and this is not all bad, right? We can make money. I just walked through Barry Global and Anthem. Um, but I certainly think you, you certainly need a diversified portfolio at this moment. And I know that guys like you, um, the pressure over the past year and a half has been sell my boring Warren Buffett or value guys and go buy these growth guys because they seem to know where it's happening and we're seeing a bit of reversal. So it talks about why you truly need a diversified portfolio. Um, but yeah, listen, if, if, if we do eight, nine over the next three years in our, in our pure equity funds, I think we would be happy with, uh, with something along that line. So I don't know if that gives you the perspective you're looking for, but you know, oh, for sure it does. And, uh, you know, the, the, the thing, you know, the media loves to create angst and anxiety. And, uh, you know, as soon as there's a, a, an adjustment in pricing, all of a sudden the articles are coming out and the world's coming to an end, et cetera, right. et cetera. Well, the world was coming to an end with COVID. Yeah. Now they're playing on this Russian Ukraine thing and whatever. They'll, they'll generate excitement. For the professionals, they love that because it means they get to buy businesses at a good price because the uh, people that shouldn't be owning them are selling because for whatever reason. But I mean, it's I mean, one thing we, we should all keep in mind, in my view, is that the governments of the world are not going to crush the economy with interest rate hikes. That's not their purpose or goal. And, and they also have to finance debt. So that's not in their interest either. So they have to bring interest rates back up to what would be considered normal, which may yeah. be a one or 2% above where they are today, but they're not going to crush growth for any uh, you know, any obvious reasons, it just wouldn't make any sense. So. Yeah, Jeff, I agree uh, 100% is you, you, know, you look at the fourth quarter of 2018, they tried to normalize rates and backfired, they quickly turned around and <clears throat> brought more stimulus. You know, you think about a central banker's mandate, it's, it's full employment and price stability. They have the full employment, at least down in the States. And now they're trying for a bit of price stability, but they're not going to torpedo the economy. And, and you're seeing that in credit spreads. Um, again, we were talking with uh, Eric and, and uh, Pear before. If you look at, at the, the 
triple C, which is in the uh, high yield market, right? Which was once loving, refer, lovingly referred to as junk bonds, but the worst of the worst, the triple C's, they're only down 0.25% year to date, where investment grade bonds are down 3.3. So, you know, credit spreads. And so for everybody on the call, you, you may be familiar, but if you're going to give money to a company rather than a government, you have to pay a higher rate. And so there's a spread. Um, and if spreads are blowing out, that's where they're, hey, defaults are coming, tough economy, uh, maybe a recession. Um, maybe these companies can't handle that. We're not seeing that in the corporate, in, in the high yield market. Spreads have remained pretty tight. So to your point, Jeff, I, I think the, the backdrop looks good on an economic basis. Um, it's just we're, we're, the market is readjusting to rates starting to go higher, right? And, and that obviously impacts the highest multiple stocks the most uh, with the ones specifically that are making no money. Um, those got hit the hardest, the quickest, and then it trickled into the highest quality Microsofts of the world, Amazons. Uh, but again, great businesses that should do well long-term um, and not that they shouldn't be part of a portfolio, but we've just kind of highlighted um, to manage some of the uncertainty and risks there, we have a different take that can add value in a portfolio. So uh, I, I saw some questions come in. I saw crypto, which I can't go over. I got another question for you here, Greg, you ready? Shoot. Um, so with the strong inflationary climate that's going on, uh, we all see prices going up, you yeah. have supply chain disruptions and truckers and so forth. You have threats from impending variants, uh, you know, Omicron part two, or I guess the next yeah. one is maybe the pie variant, uh, yeah. which I'm actually looking forward to the jokes on that one. Um, the Ukraine issue, um, which actually is uh, pretty scary, uh, having some Ukrainian uh, close friends. Yeah. Um, is this the time to invest heavily or is this the time to boost liquid savings? You know the answer to that pair. So I'm going to put it back to you guys. <laughs> I think I made the comment um, that timing the market is virtually impossible and your portfolio has to align with your personal plan and comfort level. And I think that's where, uh, you know, a huge amount of the value you guys bring to the table. And I brought up that example of how easy would it have been to go into cash in March of 2000, yep. right? And you missed the huge rebound. And here's the question, have you gotten back in yet? And, and if not, are you gonna wait till um, the markets go down? Oh, and if the markets are down, doesn't that mean it's uncertain? So maybe now is not the time to get in? You're absolutely right, Greg. And you've been <laughs> oh, at this game long enough. Yeah, and- as my hairline would suggest. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and mine keeps going back too. So, so the, the, the you know, you're really right, because if you look at March of 2020, you know, I think we sent an email to everybody in the end of, end of that month. And we said, you know, guys, if you got extra cash, you want to dial up risk, now's the time because we've seen this movie before. Right. And then, and I recall being on, on Bay Street in 08 and 09, and, and the markets bottomed uh, on my birthday uh, in March of 2009. Uh, and that was also the time to not uh, hit the panic button. So, but people who stuck with it and studies show if people stuck with it in 08 09 and people stuck with it in 2020 came out way ahead right um things rebounded they let their managers who are running these you know global portfolios that we're holding like yourself yeah. right and they let the managers go out and find the co good companies that are on sale as jeff always says and then and then they made their money back and 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 more and the yeah. and you know unfortunately we've all had clients that have hit the panic button in you know at the bottom and never been able to get back in and 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 then and there you go right and and then you're you're basically toast and that's yeah. that's the problem and so the the idea is to have a diversified portfolio rebalance regularly check in with your advisor regularly so we can rebalance your portfolio get back you know take some chips off the table as we make the money and that way when times like this happen you're ready to go and again you know i think economies on solid footing um, rates are going to go a bit higher. So some companies are going to suffer, but managers have adjusted to that, right? You guys have adjusted your portfolio in anticipation of that. And I think other managers have too. So, so in general, um, not the time to freak out. Um, there will be stuff on sale and it'll be an opportunity. Yeah. So uh, I just, uh, I just want to mention to everyone on, on the call, uh, this is one of the reasons we, we work with Greg and, and his team at Edgepoint because they have a philosophy that we like that makes sense. And, and you know, we've reminded everyone, you know you, you know, you don't own the market, you own businesses in the market 
through the market, but you own businesses. Yeah. And you know, you don't sell good businesses that are making money. It's it's not a smart thing to do. So if you're not sure what of what you own and you're just speculating or you're day trading and you are trying to make a quick buck, that's another game. That's not what we do. Uh, we uh, we put money away that will work with you for your lifetime, and that means you have to put it in good places. And that's exactly the type of uh, firm that Greg has, and uh, and we're very we're very lucky to have him, to be quite honest with you. So, thank you, Greg. Yeah, per- perfect. You know, the only thing I'll mention, and you guys know this, when you're doing the pl- the, the importance of a plan, because someone might be about to retire, or someone's retired. Right. And, you know, you don't want to take out money when it's going down. You know, stocks are the long term. Yeah, that works. But if you have to, you know, so I'm, I'm sure as advisors in the planning process, you've built in some offsets that if someone, you know, has those, you know, uh, those need those liquid needs, you have some things to take from if the markets are down. So, it, again, it's it's trying not to time and it's building that portfolio that, uh, to tailor to the individual needs. And you're right, Jeff, I'll just highlight one quick point is if you think about the, you know, you talked about owning businesses and that's how we view it. We're not speculators. We're not traders. We own businesses. And if you critically think about the wealthiest person, you know, personally, um, they're either business owners or descendants of business owners, I would guess. And they did not buy a business for six months, go to cash, wait for the economy to prove and buy another business six months later, right? They, they built that up over time. And so, um, so yeah, that, that's what we're trying to do. There was one more that I wanted to, to get yeah. to, uh, and it's, I'll try to tie it in. One of the, the funds that we, we own with Edgepoint with, for a lot of our portfolio, client portfolios is the, the global growth and income portfolio. And a sleeve of that is about roughly 40% fixed income. I wanted to tie that into a question that came through about uh, crypto and that side of things. But how do you think about the, say, the, the fixed income environment moving forward, seeing where, where rates are going? And then what, what are Edge, Edgepoint's thoughts on the, the crypto space? Is that something that you're looking at? Uh, how does that fit in? And is that how does that fit into the, the gold equation as well? Can you talk about a bit about sure. uh, those two points before sure. and then yeah. we'll... I'll, I'll start with the fixed income exposure in our global growth and income. So as you noted, the, 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 the biggest mandate that you have with Edgepoint is the Edgepoint global growth and income. There's an equity sleeve and there is a fixed income sleeve that is, uh, yeah, roughly 36, 37 uh, percent cash and fixed income. You know, I, I think with interest rates going to emergency levels, which is very, very, very low, Right. The 10 year, I think the 10 year in the crisis got below one and the 10 year rate in the United States is what, 1.7, 1.8 in that range. Um, so imagine lending someone in this environment money for 10 years and getting 1.7% in return and inflation just clocked in at five. <laughs> you know, to us, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so what we've done is our there's a there's a metric called duration that's the average term of your bonds and we're we're below two meaning most of our bonds mature within the next one or two years um so you the the return perspective on that is terrible right right now i think we're earning maybe a little over two percent on those bonds but we're not we're, we're saying hey we don't want to take the risk of going out for an extra 2.2 percent and get 2.2 and lend out 10 years. And if inflation starts to take off, you know, those bonds can get hurt. So, so right now we've really shortened our duration. So the index has a duration of about eight. Most of our, our colleagues tend to feel safe sticking close to that. But we think looking at a benchmark uh, and basing your decisions on that is crazy. <laughs> uh, so we just, we're totally agnostic to that. And, and uh, the, you know, the the, the return potential is not worth the risk in bonds today. So we're hiding out in very short duration bonds, waiting for some kind of wobble for us to redeploy the, um, the, 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 those bonds at higher rates and not be locked in for 10 years. So that um, is on the fixed income. I'll pause to see if there's any questions or, or comments on that before I go to crypto. I think good. that's good. Thumbs up on that. Okay. Um, now, from a crypto perspective, I just want to highlight what we said at the beginning is that um, our, our mandate in Edgepoint Global or Global Growth and Income is to grow purchasing power over time. So, you know, you put in $100,000 today, we hope when you retire, you know, 10, 
five, whether it's two, five, 10, or whatever, you're retired for 30 years. Even if you're 90, you got to figure you've got 10 years in you, right? So um, we're trying to say, if you put money with us, 100,000, we want to make sure that, that, that when you need it, it can buy more than 100,000, right? We're trying to grow purchasing power. And we do that by investing in businesses that generate a stream of cash flow and ideally a rising stream of cash flow. The reason I give that as a backdrop to Bitcoin is, is as you know, like gold, it does not generate an income stream. So is there validity to blockchain technology? Absolutely. You know, will that be filtered into some of the companies that we own and, and utilize to help that business be better? Absolutely. That's a real thing. Do we own crypto? No. Um, quite frankly, at this point, it doesn't generate a rising stream of income. And we always say our job is if someone's at point A and they're trying to get to point B, and for most people, that's a successful retirement that might last 30 plus years, is how do we get people to point B? Um, you know, so they have a rising stream of income in retirement. Crypto doesn't fit that bill. So we're not here to say, or, you know, there's, there's a wide range of opinions at EdgePoint. There's some uh, of our managers that have a wide libertarian streak that love uh, not dealing with the government and, and being outside their purview. <laughs> um, and we do recognize the technology behind it is, is sound, um, but we're certainly uh, not in crypto at this point in time. And just to follow, are there any businesses in that space that you're looking at or considering or keeping on the radar? So maybe not to be purely in there, but are there any businesses that are coming up to the forefront that might meet that criteria while not being crypto, but being say an underpinning or a Cisco that could provide that. Is that part of the, the research or any thoughts on that? Yeah, it not, I mean, a lot of those have been the darlings of the market, right? So if there's, we had a, a, an internal chat on Monday for a couple of hours and we were talking about how Microsoft is not the same as the tech bubble because it's, you know, it's a, it's a really high quality business and it's nowhere near the valuations it was at the tech bubble. The closest equivalent we get to the tech bubble is crypto. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot, you know, that liquidity uh, uh, pumped into the system had to go somewhere and it did find its, its corner. And, you know, I think there are, there's 9,000 different coins, right? As we know, some coins were started as a joke. Um, that now are worth, you know, $8 billion in market cap. Um, you know, I don't know if I could go back to, um, to pair Eric or Jeff, if we invested in that and it fell 50% and tell you why we owned it in the first place. Um, so no, and, and, and whether it's Coinbase or those various, you know, crypto trading platforms, um, or companies that are putting, uh, uh, a crypto on their balance sheet instead of cash, um, we're not really interested because they're well known. And I think, you know, it, uh, the prices work. We don't feel we bring a proprietary insight to any of that space at this point in time. So the answer is no. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. A currency is not supposed to be something you speculate on. It's something you buy things with. It is not something that you make money on technically. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I mean, think about it. If you buy crypto, you're buying it in the hopes that someone will buy it from you at a higher price. And that person's buying it for buying in the hopes of selling it to somebody else at a higher price. <laughs> and so we, we just don't have a thesis on why that would happen, right? Um, some people view it as, as the electronic gold, right? It's your diversification um, against inflation, but that, that relationship seems to have broken down in this correction. So it, uh, um, you know, where, yeah. where gold has a bit more of a, of a history, maybe closer to 5,000 years of, uh, being an offset and, and and we don't hold gold either. It doesn't generate a, ca a revenue stream. Not saying that someone shouldn't own it, um, but we do own uh, we do own a, a couple of gold or precious metal royalty companies. Um, you know, Franco Nevada in the global portfolio. It's uh, generating a five percent free cash flow yield. Um, it, that's a real business, right? And um, you know, with, with a bit of the debasement of the monetary uh, systems around the world, it's nice to have something that actually generates cash flow that maybe if currencies are devalued, you have some hedge uh, against that in the portfolio. But again, not a huge bet, right? Like we're talking two, 3% of the portfolio. Well, it's already been an hour and three minutes. So I just want to thank everybody for, for joining us and for Greg for, for sharing oh, yeah. this lunch hour and the insight. I mean, I, I, received a lot out of and I think all of our participants, regardless of where you're coming from, uh, helped understand, well, one, the edge point approach, but mostly how 
uh, this figures in the market and, and where this goes and what this means. So a big thank you. I want to share one analogy. When Greg was originally explaining the edge point approach, I, I to, to to coin the, the sports analogy, I thought, uh, sorry, are you like the Zach Hyman or the Michael Bunting of sports in the sense that edge point is the one that might not be the sexiest, but does the work in order to bring victory and growth. So uh, that's one analogy I like to share. Uh, it might not be the Austin Matthews, the sexy, the Zooms, the Pelotons, but without somebody getting you the puck or getting the ball or doing the hard work, uh, you will not be successful. And I think that's how we think of things. And that's why we've partnered with Edgepoint and uh, weave that into the portfolios for long-term uh, growth and success. So yeah. I wanted to share that uh, analogy uh, with everybody in, in putting things together. So a big thank you. We have a few upcoming events that uh, invites have gone out for, but that we will also be sending some reminders. What should I do with my surplus money? Uh, before the RSP deadline, so we'll be looking at uh, TFSA, RSP, mortgage, and, and also putting together, uh, sharing kind of our thoughts, uh, as Greg had today, about the outlook and what that means for investing. So we'll weave that all together on February 1st. We have part of our quarterly business owner seminars series um, for on the HR side of things. That's Wednesday, February 16th with Sarah Manhout. And then we also have two specialized uh, tax Ask Me Anythings with uh, one of our accounting partners. So the, all those invites are coming. Uh, if you don't have the invite or you'd like to attend, please send us a note, we'll get that to you. And if you do have any other topics that you think would be interesting, please send us a note. We love to, uh, to run these webinars and share with you kind of the partners that we build our practice on and uh, that help us. So we like bringing that to the forefront. We have some great faces and great insights. So a big thank you to Greg for uh, sharing this hour and sharing these thoughts with us. Yeah. Thank you, Greg, for, uh, for all your insight all your thoughts. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think we all came out of this a little more comfortable and a little more educated. So thank you so much. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for having me guys. Have a great day. Okay. Stay warm, everybody. Yes. Bye. Bye.